Hello guys, and welcome back to another episode of Trey the Explainer. And today, we have another installment of Anthropology Profile, and today we have a rather fascinating and interesting topic, in my opinion, because we're going to talk about disabilities and physical abnormalities, wait for it, in prehistory. Disabilities or handicaps seem to have existed as long as life itself has evolved, and by far long predates humanity. These physical conditions appear in animal populations almost constantly and can be a result of either genetic traits that result in abnormal growth from birth, or a disease or injury developed over the course of one's life that doesn't fully heal or recover. And, typically, when these physical handicaps arose in organism populations like a lame foot or paralysis, or even something as minor as poor vision, individual organisms with disabilities would be killed off by the process of natural selection, due to predators or inability to find food or mates. It was an unfortunate but effective system, and it was just the way of the world. A rabbit that is deaf or a gazelle with a bad foot is much less likely to escape a fox or a lion than one with healthy ears and feet. But us humans have a knack for messing things up, and somewhere along the line, humanity started to care for and aid these individuals. We developed something called compassion. For example, anyone around today can be born paralyzed from the waist down, or completely blind, or mentally disabled, and survive to adulthood, and live a long and happy life. No problem, due to the compassion and care society and their family members give them. When in the wild and before the development of modern medicine, this wouldn't have been the case. Humans have, to a certain extent, slowed natural selection. Technically, depending on your definition, a lot of us have physical disabilities. That would be selected out of the population if we lived in the hunter-gatherer lifestyle of our Paleolithic ancestors. I have very poor eyesight, a trait that was passed down from both my parents, and I required the assistance of glasses and contacts in order to do almost anything. So odds are I'd be dinophilus food if I lived in prehistoric times, or at the very least considered handicapped before the advent of glasses. Earlier today, I took a moment to look around the food court I was in to see how many people possessed this disability. In my field of view alone, about like 50% of people had glasses on. Bygone are the days in which we would leave somebody to get eaten or starve for a disability. We tend to think that this is a relatively recent development in our culture as a people, and to some extent it is. Human societies definitely haven't always tolerated or cared for disabled or handicapped individuals. Attitudes towards handicapped individuals have changed most drastically in the past several centuries. Heck, just in the past century, we had eugenics and freak shows that planned to eliminate or denigrate such individuals respectively. Mental disabilities and dwarfism in medieval Europe were considered the product of demonic possession and sin and were often treated as such, with their only opportunities to survive in society being as court jesters and fools. Other societies, most famously the ancient Spartans, if histories are to be believed, killed infants that possessed the slightest bit of imperfections, imposing a biological artificial selection of sorts on themselves. Even someone as bright as Aristotle is said to have been an advocate for eugenics in the killing of disabled children when saying, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. When you learn how cruel societies once were, one shudders to wonder what life was for disabled individuals further back into prehistory, when life was even rougher and tougher and more brutal. Surely disabled individuals would have had no place in Paleolithic hunter-gatherer societies. We often get this image that prehistoric humans and ancient humans, or cavemen, were much like animals in this respect. Cruel, cold, and savage. They would let natural selection take its course with such individuals, letting them starve or die as a result of their inability to survive in their harsh environment. But this couldn't be further from the truth. There is actually an enormous amount of evidence to illustrate that peoples and societies throughout history, regardless of time period or location, showed compassion to disabled individuals, and in not only caring for them, but at times treating them and accepting them into society as normal and valued members, and at times even honoring them as heroes in spite of their handicaps. And it really breaks down the idea that these were cavemen or savages. They were people. People who cared and loved for one another deeply. And in this episode, I'll be giving the amazing examples of these trends and the individual remains and stories that prove them. But before we talk about them, let's talk about the biology of compassion. And what is it exactly? Compassion and altruism are a fascinating evolutionary phenomenon. We are incredibly social animals, and it is perhaps our most important trait next to intelligence. As I will show, throughout history, we have a very strong instinct for kinship and compassion. Something in our genes tells us to help fellow members of our species, even if it isn't exactly advantageous for ourselves. And there are many possible scientific explanations for why this might have evolved in the first place. 
I find it likely that this might have developed or stemmed from a you scratch my back, I scratch yours kind of thing, where cooperation helped our species and our ancestors survive in times of crisis. We typically don't like to see other members of our species suffer or die, and it likely relates to the days in which the loss of a group member in a tribe meant the likely death of an entire tribe. An alternative explanation might have been a more complicated form of natural selection where saving or helping those who carry the same genes as you, like a brother or sister, ensured a higher likelihood of your own gene survival, although you yourself are not the one directly passing them down. Compassion or altruism doesn't seem to be limited to humans. Chimpanzees, both in the wild and in captivity, have been documented demonstrating selflessness and care. One individual rescued a member of their family from drowning, and a wild adult male chimpanzee adopted an unrelated orphan chimp as his own. Food and meat are typically shared amongst the entire tribe regardless of who hunted and who didn't in chimp societies. Tools such as a hammer or anvil used for cracking nuts have been documented to be shared amongst group members. The list goes on and on, and definitely isn't limited to just chimpanzees. Whether this is true compassion or not, it nonetheless demonstrates that primates closely related to us are capable of showing selflessness, and it might say something about the emotions and attitudes of primitive humans, which is exactly what we are talking about now. Neanderthals. Throughout pop culture, depictions of other humans that coexisted with our ancestors, Neanderthals or Homo erectus, haven't been too flattering to say the least. It might be because of their appearance with the sloping forehead and heavy brow, but other members of Homo are often believed to have been much more ape-like in behavior than us Homo sapiens. They are often depicted as ignorant and stupid, squat and sluggish brutes, ape-men who live brutal lives and would leave their dead and dying to the wolves and scavengers. H.G. Wells described them as the grizzly folk in one of his short stories in which he portrayed Neanderthals in much the same manner in which he described his fictional human descendants of the far future, the Morlocks, as savage and barbaric creatures that only vaguely resembled humanity only in shape and advocated for their extinction. Yes, Neanderthals have become the quintessential caveman image, and according to pop culture, prehistoric Homo sapiens were cruel. Neanderthals were even crueler than that. However, this image of Neanderthals, and even more ancient humans, is likely entirely false, and they were in fact more like us emotionally and mentally than we typically like to think. There is a cave at the top of a mountain in Iraq that speaks volumes to Neanderthal family bonds and concepts of kinship and compassion. Deep within the depths of the Shani Dar cave, the remains of several 65,000 to 35,000 year old Neanderthals were discovered. Now, Neanderthal bones are relatively common throughout Europe and the Middle East, but the curious thing about the ones in this cave in particular is that the Neanderthal individuals that resided in it apparently attained absurdly old ages. One individual was at the time of their death between the ages of 35 and 40, and two individuals were somewhere between the ages of 40 and 50. This, needless to say, was an amazing feat for the time period in environmental conditions. Neanderthals and even Homo sapiens scarcely reached such ages at the time, with the equivalent in modern human years today probably being around 80 years old. The age of these individuals alone says something about the culture and family unit they belong to, but it gets more interesting when one examines one of these elderly Neanderthals closer. One skeleton named Shanidar 1, or Nandi for short by excavators, upon closer inspection wasn't only very old but possessed many physical deformities visible in his body. His skull specifically illustrated that he had been violently struck or hit on the left side of his face at some time in his life. This blow was so hard that it fractured his left orbit, which would have left him partially if not fully blind in one of his eyes. Furthermore, later analysis showed that he suffered from serious hearing loss in both of his ears due to blockage, partially in his left and fully in his right, which meant he must have been close to death, a serious handicap for a hunter guy of their lifestyle. But that's not all. Nandy also appears to have suffered from a withered arm, something he appears to might have possessed since birth, which essentially meant that he lost the use of his lower arm and hand. This arm appears to have been later amputated at the elbow later in his life. Lastly, possibly related to all the aforementioned injuries and disabilities, Nandi also possessed deformities in his lower legs and foot that resulted in him possessing a serious and painful limp in order to walk. Poor Nandi, man that stinks. With all those injuries and deformities, Nandi's simple day-to-day -day life would have been especially painful and excruciating. But and this is the most interesting thing of all, is that all these afflictions were acquired long before his death and show signs of extensive healing. Living with such ailments meant that Nandi obviously couldn't have cared for himself, and even simple tasks like walking or even communicating would have been near impossible and very painful. He would have been a complete burden on his family. But, despite all his flaws, all his needs, this one-armed, deaf, blind man's family cared for him. They must have fed him, cleaned up after him, loved him, nonetheless, and kept him alive for a very long time, despite the fact that he couldn't reciprocate or contribute to their survival. 
He was somebody's father or grandfather or uncle, and they loved him for it. Nandi provides just by his existence that Neanderthals cared for their sick and elderly, just as we do today. But Nandi might just be the tip of the iceberg. A cranium discovered in Spain and dated older than 500,000 years old might suggest that compassion existed in humans for a very, very long time, much older than even Nandi. SH-14 is a skull discovered in Spain that belonged to a young child that survived to the age of at least five years old. The skull, although small and seemingly insignificant, possesses the earliest known case of human brain deformity in the fossil record. The age of the remains suggests they belong to a member of Homo erectus, perhaps among the ancestors of the Neanderthals like Nandi. Again, the age of the skull suggests something about the family of the child it was born into. The physical deformity this child possessed would have been easily and clearly visible even at a young age, and early in development. However, this child was not tossed aside or rejected at birth, but was kept and survived for years. Why? It seems like ignoring those sloping foreheads and heavy brows, our distant ancestors and relatives were people just like us, and felt and loved much like we do. And it is Neanderthals, and maybe even Homo erectus, not us Homo sapiens, that show the earliest evidence of compassion and care for the disabled. Us Homo sapiens do, however, have a lot of evidence of care for the physically disabled throughout prehistory. Perhaps the earliest of this is evidence of dwarfism in a 10,000-year-old boy from Paleolithic southern Italy. The skeleton of Romito II was discovered in a cave alongside several other humans. Judging from his skeleton, Romito II was a young man that survived to about 17 to 20 years of age. But what was quickly apparent was that he had been born with a severe case of dwarfism. He would have possessed normal intelligence and no serious medical conditions. However, his arms and body would have been very short, and he would have possessed limited mobility of his elbows and knees. In a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, Romito II would have possessed a serious handicap when hunting or just keeping up with a group, especially when looking at the rugged terrain in which he lived. However, again, his age of 17 suggests that he was at the very least tolerated and cared for by his community, and maybe even something more. The cave in which R2 was found appears to have been an important social and ritual center, and from the limited number of burials in the cave, it can be inferred that only certain members of society that achieved a certain status could be buried there. Romito II might not have only been tolerated by his society, but he had been accepted or even honored by it, despite his severe handicaps and limited abilities. Dwarfs have existed throughout history, and as the intro to this video shows, it appears attitudes to them have varied from culture to culture. There is a skeleton discovered in the remains of a Byzantine city cemetery in Israel from the 5th to 8th century. That might have been, due to his medieval time period, a living, breathing Tyrian Lannister. This male dwarf lived to between 35 to 50 years old, but most interesting is his burial in the Christian cemetery. His burial, position, and grave were virtually identical to every other person buried in that cemetery. The unremarkable and ordinary nature of his burial says something, as it seems to suggest that this individual, in the eyes of the population of the Byzantine city, was an ordinary member of society and should be treated as an equal, despite his physical appearance. Paralysis Another interesting case of prehistoric humans caring for disabled individuals is the abundance of semi-paralyzed to paralyzed individuals in the archaeological record. The remains of a young boy were found in Florida and were 7,500 years old. The boy, however, had been born with a severe spinal malformation, which would have made him, among other things, paralyzed from the waist down from birth. Nonetheless, he survived another 15 years. Another boy from Vietnam 4,000 years ago had been born with Kleipelfell syndrome, and as a result, his movements were limited to perhaps only his arms, but he lived to 10 years old. Both these boys belonged to hunter-gathering to semi-hunter-gathering societies, but again, were cared for nonetheless. But perhaps my favorite of prehistoric paralyzed individuals has to be that of a 4,000-year-old woman from the Arabian Peninsula. The woman had contracted a severe neuromuscular disease, likely polio, in her early life, which caused her limbs to be exceedingly thin and walking and movement very difficult. According to anthropologist Deborah L. Martin, she would have required around-the-clock care, and that seems to have been exactly what she got as she lived to the age of 18. Ironically, one of the few health problems her body possessed was not a result of her disease. This woman's teeth were full of cavities, cavities that likely resulted from her family group feeding her too many dates and apparently spoiling her with sweets to make her happy. The enormous amount of sticky sweets she was fed eventually rotted her teeth out, which is very unusual for someone so young and of that time period. But perhaps my all-time favorite example of handicapped individuals throughout history has to be a single skeleton buried in a Native American burial mound in northwestern Georgia at the King site. 
In David J. Halley's book, King, the Social Archaeology of a Late Mississippian Town in Northwestern Georgia, lended to me by one of my professors, thank you so much, Halley examined the large amount of Native American human remains ceremonially buried at the site. Halley references the skeleton of a single individual named Burial 223. This individual had been buried with all the traits of male warriors of high military honors and warfare in Mississippian society. Points, massive bifacial blades, hematite, in Bakulema, all symbols and trophies achieved through and to display great acts of military valor, and it was assumed that this was a great male warrior in life. So it was a complete shock when the DNA evidence illustrated that the skeleton and all those trophies and symbols of military status belonged to a 25-year-old woman who, upon closer examination, had a severe hip deformity likely received through an accident in childbirth. 223 stands alone as an exception in the entire site. The culture at King, especially in the burials, put great emphasis on the gender distinctions between male and female categories. Women at the King site are typically lacking in burial objects, and are never buried with the overwhelmingly traditional male artifacts she had been buried with. Everything about her burial was common of a male, but he was a she, and she seems to stand against the distinct and strict gender categories presented at the rest of the site. And not only was she buried with military honors, but extremely high ones. The average age of males buried with large bifacial blades is 40 years old. 223 was 25 when she died, and seems to have achieved such a high status as a warrior in an extremely short amount of time, with a physical disability that would have made walking and running a little difficult, meaning she not only overcame several difficulties in her lifetime, but it rose to the top as a bona fide hero despite her age, physical deformity, and gender. This woman very likely lived a truly fascinating life. It's probably an amazing story about a person who was dealt a difficult situation, but by far rose above their situation through willpower and dedication. She might have been a female Native American version of the fabled disabled Viking warrior, Ivar the Boneless. She also seems to have vindicated Cherokee stories of warrior women, fierce female warriors who fought in battles and achieved privileges, typically reserved for men, who by some accounts became warrior women to avenge their slain husbands by going on a revenge mission killing their husband's killers. You got a widowed warrior woman with a hip deformity. If only Bones could talk. The unknown and the unspoken. All these individuals seem to completely dissolve the idea that early humans were savage or cruel when it comes to handicaps and disabilities. It seems many of them, if you were a dwarf or paralyzed or simply received major injuries, were treated normally by their societies, and at times even elevated above that. It seems compassion has always been there, and the incidents in which it occurred were overshadowed by times it didn't. The simple fact we have found so many people like this in the fossil and archaeological record says something about the prevalence of compassion and care towards disabled individuals. The remains of people in general preserve and survive rare enough already, so therefore there must have been an enormous number of stories like these ones common throughout prehistoric societies in history. So next time you see depictions of cavemen being cruel and unfeeling creatures, just think of the countless cases in which our ancestors illustrated that they had a heart. And with that, thanks for watching. It's been really neat researching and learning about how common disabilities were in the ancient world, and seeing how all our ancestors were people, people who cared for one another deeply. It's a hopeful thing to think about next time you lose hope in humanity's goodness. If Neanderthals can love and care for one another, why shouldn't we? I know, I know, that's a really cheesy line. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed and learned something from this episode of Anthropology Profile. I am deeply sorry for the long wait on this one, you know, ugh. Hope to see you next time.